Welcome back. And we're moving into our second conversation for today, talking about the child protection system. We have with us the founder of the Child Development Fund Foundation, Diana Shaw. Good morning and welcome. Good morning and welcome. So glad to be here. Well, we appreciate you stopping in. And of course, uh, we know that while you are the founder of the Child Development Foundation, you're also an attorney and you've worked extensively uh, assessing and making recommendations for the child protection system in Belize. Yes. 17 years of my life devoted you, to this now. You're Belizean now, man. <laughs> 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 but Diana, but yes. let's, let's take the opportunity. We know with the recent case uh, of murder of uh, the U.S. adopted child, uh, Phelan Cannon, there's been a lot of conversation questions and concerns that people have had about the child protection system. Mm -hmm. And I want to start off by just having your perspective, since you've done so much assessment on, on the system, on how effective it is. Okay. All right, first let me talk about what it is. Well, so the yeah. child protection system in Belize consists of the networking of agencies, government as well as non-government mm -hmm. um, organizations, and the community responsibility to create a protective system and environment for children. So basically and ultimately, the protection of children is the state's responsibility under the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Mm -hmm. It's a state party that has the ultimate responsibility to ensure that laws are in place, that there are government institutions that are there to identify, to protect, rescue and provide rehabilitation for children who yeah. experience abuse, neglect and exploitation. Mm -hmm. And we do have that. We have the Department of Human Services within the Ministry of Human Development and Social Transformation that really heads that up. But they are supported by other agencies. We have the police department as mm -hmm. a key stakeholder partner. In terms of Belize, we have legislation that provides for mandatory reporting of abuse. And the two agencies that receive mandatory reports are the Department of Human Services and the police department. Mm -hmm. In addition, we have the Ministry of Health that supports as well the child protection system. Children who are injured are sometimes taken to the hospitals. And it's necessary for the doctors, nurses to understand that they too have a responsibility for mandatory reporting to yeah. report those instances into the system. The education system is a part of the child protection system. Teachers are actually one of the main reporters of child abuse. They tend to see the indicators. They have some training that mm -hmm. has been provided to most of them and they are able to see indicators because they spend a longer time with the child. Mm -hmm. That's right. So most of the reports do come from teachers. Of course, there are other agencies that are also involved. In some cases, immigration may be involved um, in providing protection for children. And as I said before, it's not just the government state agencies, but you also have the community, community-based organizations. You have organizations like CDF. Um, you have organizations like YES, BFLA that are working on the ground in communities that also have a responsibility to help in advocating for children helping with prevention, prevention efforts and then reporting what we see. And the public. Yeah. The public is a part of the system. And, and that's where we have to make a very clear message. There are mandatory obligations. Yes. Uh, uh, parties. Uh, parties, yeah. So your police, your teachers, your doctors, if they see something that looks report. like abuse, they have a legal obligation to yes. report it. And the social agencies like children's homes as yeah, well, institutions yeah. that care for children. The rest of us have a moral obligation. Yes. Yeah? Yeah, it's a voluntary um, yeah. obligation that if you see something, you should say something. Yeah. Um, but certainly for organizations that work in this area, we encourage communities and people in the community to not just say, well, it's just voluntary, so it's not my role. Yeah. It's the police's role. No, it's not. It's our role mm -hmm. because we are more likely to see it than the police. In some right. communities, there isn't a police officer. That's right. And how do you make the distinction? Because for a lot of people, what one might consider as being abused, another might consider as discipline and right. how I raise my child. So how exactly. do you make that distinction? So this is where education becomes important. And that's a big part of what organizations like CDF, YES, BFLA does. I think probably most of the work of CDF is on bringing public awareness to yeah. what is abuse, because people don't know. Um, a lot of people focus on physical abuse because yeah. it's the most likely to be seen because you see bruises, you yeah. see cuts, um, you see uh, and injury bones. and stuff like that. But you have other kinds of abuse, emotional abuse, when a parent belittles a child or a caregiver talks down to a child, tell them they're good for nothing, um, undermines the child's right yeah. to express their emotions or their feelings. That's a form of abuse. Yeah. We have sexual abuse, and that is rampant. Yeah. I repeat, rampant. Yeah. It is now in some, some 
places outpacing physical abuse in terms of the reports that are being made. It's rampant. And that involves any kind of sexual activity with children who are under the age of consent, um, firstly. But even if the child is at the age of consent, of course, you know that it can be rape, incest. Those are all forms of abuse that also affect children. Predominantly, what we see are caregivers, persons who have parental roles, uncles, aunts, stepfathers, adoptive parents who are perpetrators of sexual abuse against um, yeah. children. That's the form of abuse that it is most likely that it's somebody that lives with a child or is closely connected to the child that is the perpetrator more and, than any other kind of abuse. And I think this is where Jamie's question is most relevant because you won't necessarily see the sexual, the activity. sexual abuse. You won't yes. see the activity take place. But I think we've all been in that situation where something just doesn't oh, look right. Or sorry. you have the intuition that a child is uncomfortable around someone. Yes. Is that enough? to go to a human services department or a police department and say, you know, I haven't seen it, but something doesn't seem right. Is that enough? What we say to people, if you feel that something isn't right, don't keep silent about it. Because unlike instances with physical abuse or even verbal abuse, when it comes to sexual abuse, the child is most unlikely to self-report. Mm -hmm. If your mother break your hand, I mean, you're going to be in pain, you're going to tell somebody you're hurting, somebody going to see it, and you're going to say, well, my mother did a beat me and broke my hand. Children don't report sexual abuse unless they're prompted. Mm -hmm. So somebody has to see something and say something to the child to give them the comfort to create a safe environment for them to say, you know what, I need to talk about this. So look for indicators. As uh, Marlene rightly said, you may not see the, the sexual activity, but you will see behavioral cues. And that's the main thing. You see behavioral cues firstly in, in the interaction of that person with the child. Why is this person giving overt romantic kind of attention to this child? Buying this child a special gift that is not appropriate for a child. Mm -hmm. Buying lingerie and having the child do things that adults will be doing. Mm -hmm. Why is this person wanted only to spend alone time with this particular child? Mm -hmm. Usually, it's the other parent or somebody in the house that sees that. That's usually the first red flag. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, what we have seen, though, is that the other parent who sees that says to themselves, you know what? I'm too sensitive. This is a good man. He wouldn't try to abuse my daughter. Mm -hmm. And they don't say anything. Mm -hmm. But by not saying anything, they actually give immunity to the perpetrator, mm -hmm. where they feel that what I'm doing is okay, accepted. it is accepted, and then they go further. Yeah. So usually it starts, it is the, the, the act of sexual abuse doesn't start with the first instance the person is it's having sex them. with the child. Yeah. There is a whole process where they are <laughs> grooming this child to accept their sexual advances, and that's the time when the indicators are present. And yeah. that's the time when people around them need to be alert. When you see something is off with this person wanting to spend an inordinate amount of time with this child, you see touching that is inappropriate. Yeah. Yeah. This child putting this person, the, the, the person putting this child on their lap in suggestive ways, or the child exposing themselves to this person and the person is okay with that, or making mm -hmm. fun of it, or making sexual comments about the child's body. You shouldn't ignore that yeah. yeah because what the person is trying to do is to normalize to the child that sexual activity with them is okay and yeah. i think that's an important word the, the whole normalization of sex um, sexuality as it relates to children because there's yes. so many times even even in families that abuse isn't taking place you have parents who are comfortable dressing their kids in certain clothes or telling them oh you look sexy and they're three years old so i think that's a culture that needs to be broken as well the whole the whole the sexualization, sexualization of, children. of children. Yes. yes, parents need to be aware that that creates vulnerability. Sometimes parents are ignorant. We yeah. have seen um, parents wanting to relive their childhood to their child. Yeah. So, you know, maybe mommy now is a little bit more chubby than she used to be and mm -hmm. she can't wear all the sexy clothes that she wants when she buy it for her daughter. Mm -hmm. because she liked to see her daughter in it because you remind her of yeah. how she used to look. Mm -hmm. But she's not aware that what she's doing is that she's sending a message to a potential perpetrator yeah. that this child may be interested in sexual right. activity or has been exposed to mm -hmm. sexual activity, so it's okay for me to approach them. And yeah. that might make the child comfortable with whatever it is they're That's experiencing because exactly. they think that it's normal for me to be yes. experiencing. So parents need to be alert to that. I have had parents quarrel with me because we have gone to preschools where I've said to parents, you cannot be dressing your child 
child that way. That is not appropriate for a child that age. Mm -hmm. And they cuss me. My picnic and I be by your clothes. Or they say you are the one with the bad mind because you yes. see yeah. it as sexual. And but I, and there I are tell predators them, in this that's country. That's what I will tell them. That yeah. I said to them, listen to my friend. I have been in almost every single community in this country in Belize. There is no community here that don't have predators. Yeah. And you may not be a predator, but the person living next door to you may be. Maybe. And they're not coming to you to tell you. They're right. waiting to see when you're going to leave your child unattended. So don't be stupid. Yeah. You need as a parent to understand that it is your responsibility to provide a safe environment for children. That's the first step. Yeah. But the case may be that the parent is the abuser. Mm -hmm. we, and what happens in that? Yeah. I, I wanted to take a moment because this is an issue that really irks me. It is a, a message to the wider public. <coughs> we are very sensitive to issues of sexual abuse of children, but only children of a particular age. age. Yeah, and nice. a lot of times, I think people don't, don't, aren't aware of cycles of abuse, that mm -hmm. children who are exposed to sexual abuse at a younger age are even more vulnerable as they get older. That's so and true. when you have a 13, 14 year old and the report comes in and perhaps they returned with a perpetrator on multiple occasions, mm -hmm. Many people are so critical. Can we talk child. about that? Uh, yes. About what it does, not only to that one child when social media explodes about, you know, yeah. the choices of the child versus yeah. the wrongs of the perpetrator, yeah. what it does for future victims yeah. as well. Yeah, it's, and it's, it's a huge problem in small communities. It's not only in Belize, it, mm. it happens a lot of places. But we do have a, an issue where society shames and blames the victim mm -hmm. instead of shaming and blaming the perpetrator. Right. Yeah. They are much more likely to excuse the behavior of the perpetrator, even to cover up the behavior of the perpetrator. Yes. We have had situations in actual cases where we have been involved in interventions where the report is made about a suspected allegation of abuse and the mother leaves with the perpetrator and leaves behind the child, sends the child to live somewhere with the grandmother and relocates somewhere else mm -hmm. with the perpetrator. And that may expose other children to yeah. that perpetrator. Do you know, and I think that instills fear in people because I personally had an instance, experienced an instance where um, I knew of a child who was being emotionally abused, not, not physically or verbally, very well taken care of, sent to a really nice school, the way that the parent speaks to the child is completely inappropriate, telling you good for nothing, da da da. But my fear was if I report this, this child is going to be taken out of this very privileged home and put somewhere that might not be very privileged. And I, I struggled with this is a common fear that we see. And this is sometimes why perpetrators in affluent um, homes escape detection and escape justice. A lot of times people have that perception, even the police and even the persons who are teachers and in agencies that should be reporting. Yeah. They will say that to us, that they are struggling because they are thinking if they report and this child gets placed in a children's home because the family may not have other people here that the child can be placed with mm -hmm. our relatives, what's going to happen to this child? And I always say to them, you are thinking about it from your perspective. But when we talk about child protection issues, we have to think about it from the child's perspective. Mm -hmm. A child who is being abused would much rather not be abused than to have a comfortable bed and nice clothes. Yeah. Because the consequences and the long-term impacts of the abuse mm -hmm. are much, much worse. Yeah. In fact, that child who is in that abusive situation is sleeping in that nice bed and is not even enjoying it. Mm -hmm. It's as if they are sleeping on cardboard. It's nothing to them because the abusive situation robs their entire enjoyment of whatever else is there. Yeah, and, and also key is that, uh, while that's a fear that people have, not all reports will lead to a removal no. of and the that's, child. Uh, exactly. Sometimes so parents need help. Yes, mm -hmm. and that's, uh, so it is not a, a legitimate fear mm -hmm. because removal is really the last resort. Okay. Um, the, it's the last resort. Usually the social worker will do assessments. They are, are going to find out what is the best situation for this child. In some cases, it may be better and it may be feasible to remove the perpetrator. The law allows for that. We can mm -hmm. get occupation orders to remove somebody from the home and to ensure that these are the persons who should have the right to live in this home, exclusive of this other person. 
and then that creates safety for the family unit mm -hmm. so that the child remains with the mother and the other persons who are the caregivers mm -hmm. and the perpetrator is, is removed. They do do that. Mm -hmm. So it's not in all cases that it's an automatic removal. Okay. Removal is usually a last resort. So don't have the thinking that if you, remove, if you report, it means the child is going to be removed. That is not always the case. What if, and this is, this is one of the, the more recent conversations, what if you report but the situation doesn't change? Yes. So again, that happens because one, and I, and I say this as a community activist and also to, as we're advocating for people in the, in the community, not all reports that you make are taken seriously initially mm -hmm. because one, social workers are dealing with lots of reports yeah. uh, if the report is made to them. Sometimes the report is made to the police and the police may not immediately contact social workers for them to go and do a home visit or an assessment. And the police can do an assessment. So they have no capacity for that. Mm -hmm. So if the police don't deal with it immediately, then it's unlikely that anything is going to happen. So yeah. normally we say to people, if you report to the police, still report to human services. To human services, still report to the police. And if you wait a while and you don't see anybody coming, report again. Because by you reporting again, you are putting urgency on the situation to ensure that the persons who are responsible for responding realize that this is something that is serious. Yeah. Think about it. It's, it's, it's a normal human behavior. If yeah. you have 50 things to deal with, you're going to deal with the one that is most urgent. Yeah. You probably shouldn't, but that's what you do. So we as community members have to realize that we also have a responsibility. We are not going to be the social worker to remove the child or to go and remove the parent or to do the assessment, but we are responsible for activating the system. And we activate the system by reporting into the system. So we have to make as many reports as necessary for the system to be activated. And don't get frustrated if you make one report and you don't see anything. You have to remember at all times, this is about the child. Yeah. It's not about you being inconvenient. It's not even about the social worker not doing their job. This is about the child that needs to be protected. What about in the instance where it's a public display of abuse, where you see mm -hmm. a, a, a yes. mom with a child in a park and they beat them or they, they're dragging them? Yeah. How do you how do you report that, especially if, if you're passing or if they're passing? Hmm. So as community members, the first thing that I would say, try to interact with the parent to find out what's going on. Huh. Don't I be confrontational, and get beat but you have to be willing to take some of that. I've taken many curses. I don't mind the cursing. No, tell, tell, tell us what to say. It's right. beating tell down. What to say. I, I have been in many situations where this has happened. And what I would normally say, especially because usually it's a female parent that is beating up the child and cussing out the child, doing all kinds of things. And I will usually say, whoa, mommy, you're under a lot of problems today. What are the people do? You sound like you're stressed out. What's happening with you? I don't make it about the child. Okay. Because okay. that's just going to exacerbate the situation mm -hmm. and bring back what you remember about the child. But yeah. I know that she's probably behaving like this because something else happened mm -hmm. that triggered this. Because usually the response is completely disproportionate to what the child has done. Yeah. So obviously there is something else that is happening in her mind or in her heart. Yeah. So I engage her on that. What's going on with you? What's happening? You're so you're like you're under a lot of pressure. And then they may start talking about something that happened in their day. And then I say, whoa, well, in this situation, this child must just make that worse. You know, so just feel like you're up on the edge right now. Mm -hmm. And then, then that may help to calm them down a little bit. And then I say, but you know, in a public space like this, when you do something like that to a child, one, somebody can report. And two, what is the message you're sending to the child? Because mm -hmm. a lot of times they will do that and then afterwards they will regret it. They feel guilty. They feel guilty. They will say, you know, but boy, you know, I shouldn't take out. I was just angry and she did this and it, you know, I exploded. So then you have to talk about, okay, what can I do if the child does something inappropriate? I say to them, well, first thing, check your attitude before you start with any kind of discipline. Yeah. Yeah. Count to 10, take a deep breath to ensure that you're not passing on to the child something that you already upset about. Because that's not fair to them. That's not their responsibility. And talk about appropriate discipline. Because I've seen people beating two-year-old children because For the child don't want to stand old. still in the park. Yeah. She don't yeah. want to stay on the swing. You yeah. know, she's two. Yeah. She, that's going to happen. Now, Diana, this is, a, this is a, a, a sensitive one as well. Because I think in Belize, people have varying definitions as to what is adequate punishment. Yes. Um, and there's some who are staunch uh, supporters of corporal punishment, and there's some who are completely against it. Oh, yes. So what happens if I see 
corporal punishment taking place. I don't support corporal punishment. Should I report it? I mean, I wouldn't even know the limitations as to what is appropriate and what is not. not. Mm -hmm. And should I, re if I hear the beating and the crying, you cringe, yes. but then, you know, you don't know what the child did. So should you report physical yeah. abuse if you don't know? You know, I mean, yeah. what, what are the parameters to use? Well, for, for us as an agency that works with protecting children, our default response is that you should always report something you're suspicious about. Okay. But at the same time, try to engage the parent. And what you can look at, okay, what is the parent using to hit the child? The mm -hmm. parent is using a stick or, you know, piece of board. That's completely inappropriate. Hot Clearly, mm -hmm. that's, yeah, it's, that's going to leave some serious bruises and marks. Mm -hmm. Is the parent slapping the child in the face, yeah. um, you know, cursing the child while they're beating the child, tearing up their clothes and things like that. Definitely, that would have to be reported. So the default response is that if you're not sure, report it. Because mm -hmm. at least then it's in the system. But at the same time, try to engage the parent, especially mm -hmm. if it's somebody that you have continuous association with. It's somebody yeah. in your community. It's a neighbor. Mm -hmm. Wait until they calm down. You know, try to go over there, have a conversation, carry a piece of cake or something that is non-threatening. Yeah. Yeah. And sit and talk with them. I say, you know, you must, you're going through some, a lot of issues because I hear, you know, with a child and it sounds like, you know, the child, the, the situation in your home is mm -hmm. crazy, causing, a, causing a lot of problems and issues. You, you, you know, I am here to talk with you. Try to be an open person okay. because we have found that a lot of parents need support. Mm -hmm. People are going through a lot of problems. You have an entire society of people with stress and mental health issues mm -hmm. that they're not getting any kind of support for. Mm -hmm. So the people who are closest to them are the people that they vent on. Yeah. And usually that's their children. Mm -hmm. So as a community, part of what we can do is to provide a more supportive environment for parents. Mm -hmm. That we become that support network that we know, of our parents in our communities know that we are there to help. Yeah. Yeah. But as I said, there are some instances where if you see that a parent is consistently neglecting a child, not feeding a child properly, you know that there's consistent abuse every day. She's beating up, beating up, beating up the child. Yeah. Yeah. You try to talk to her. She's not responsive. She's cursing you out. You have to report that. You can't just say, well, you know, after them pick me and after them problem and then tell your kids, don't play with them. Yeah which is the usual response. You need to report that into the system and yeah. you need to be willing. Sometimes I think that we are too concerned about our comfort <laughs> and not wanting to destroy relationships that we have with people or mm -hmm. to cause people to think differently about their associations yeah. with us instead of being protective of children. Yeah. And yeah. our primary responsibility should be to the child. And the last the, the, the last question I had was looking at the issue of neglect because that's yes. one that we don't always understand completely. We may see that a child is left unattended very often mm -hmm. or perhaps just left to function on their own. They leave yes. the house when they want, come when they want, roam the streets, hang out on the corner. Mm -hmm. Do you rep what, what constitutes as neglect mm -hmm. and uh, when should you make a report? So neglect is the unwillingness of parents to provide care, protection, and adequate to meet the food and nutrition needs of children. Mm -hmm. you, it's different from poverty. Poverty is you don't have the ability to do it and you cannot find the ability to do it. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the ability and you don't make an effort to find the ability to do it, that is That's still neglect, neglect. Yeah. right? So it, the child needs to have adequate nutrition. Um, if the parent is not feeding the child adequate nutrition, that can constitute neglect. Parent is not providing adequate shelter. The, um, the child is left to sleep outside because the parent gone to a party or there is no place for the child to be at because the mother gone lock out the, the, the child every day and child have to stay outside until she come from work. Mm -hmm. That can constitute neglect. Mm -hmm. um, neglect can also be not just the lack of provision of food and clothing, but also lack of attention and mm -hmm. supervision, mm -hmm. which is actually usually more common, especially with teenagers. Yeah. With the younger kids, you see a lot of neglect involving lack of um, nutrition and food and clothing. With older kids, with teenagers, that's when you start to see a lot of issues with lack of parental care and supervision. Yeah. The child who is left to fend for themselves because they're 12, 13, and the, the, the parent thinks that, 
they should now be able to make decisions on their own. Or the 12 year old uh, who watched the five younger kids. Yes, that is neglect and that is widespread. Mm -hmm. It is a form of abuse that actually makes teenage children especially more vulnerable to sexual predators. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a child who is not getting supervised in the home, who is, there's no good parental communication that's happening, mm -hmm. is left to, to look after older kids, is more likely to accept the advances of somebody who is giving them a fantasy lifestyle. If you come and stay with me, we'll go to the Keys, mm -hmm. I'll take you out yeah. and we'll go to parties. That kind of lure becomes attractive. Yeah. So parents need to recognize neglect always makes children more susceptible to other forms of abuse mm -hmm. and sometimes it is an indicator that they are more um, there are other forms of abuse also happening within the home that may even be more serious yeah. so sometimes you see neglect as a predecessor to sexual abuse where mm -hmm. the, the one parent pushes away the child or no longer cares about the child because the other parent is a predator on that yeah. child so now that she's threatened by that child's position in the home and yeah. pushes away that child. Usually those behavioral cues teachers pick up and they know that something is not right in the dynamic of how this parent is interacting yeah. with this child as yeah. opposed to how this other parent is interacting with this child mm -hmm. and sometimes that can send red flags. Yeah. So we need to be observant mm -hmm. and if you see something that makes you uncomfortable, say something. Yeah. Don't be silent. Mm -hmm. Then in your, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, um, in terms of uh, the issue we see with child labor, it's very prominent in our country where you know, mimic fudge, it's send you out, go sell the fudge. And I think it's, it's part of our culture. It's so many adults have grown up doing that very same thing. They sell Johnny Cake or whatever it is. Huge. In terms of how the extent to how it's practiced, does that constitute a form of abuse? Oh, yes, it is. Yeah. It is definitely abuse. Um, it's, it, and it's illegal. They, we, the penalties aren't as strong as they should be, but it is a form of abuse. It mm -hmm. is a part of neglect um, as well because the child is being forced to fend for themselves. It can constitute criminal neglect, um, not just ordinary neglect of not providing, but not providing to the extent that the child's survival may be at stake yeah. because if they don't go and sell, then they probably won't eat. Um, if they don't go and sell, they won't be able to buy clothes for themselves because the parent has refused to provide those things. Mm -hmm. That becomes criminal neglect. And definitely that is an issue. It is an issue that is too widely accepted. Yes. Yes. And we hear a lot of things where when sometimes we do sessions in communities and we talk about that. People say, oh, but when I was smaller, I used to sell bun yeah. in the evening after school and nothing never happened to me. We are not living in the society you were living in when you were selling bun. 25, 50 years ago, yeah. there are many more perpetrators now in the community. And also there are other risks that are there for children. The traffic alone. Mm -hmm. We have had so many children that have been knocked down in rural communities um, by traffic accidents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of those kids were kids that were being sent to go to the shop to go and sell stuff with unsupervised, unattended. Mm -hmm. We see young children going to school on the highway walking down to school on the highway, yeah. three preschool age kids you, by themselves. Even in the city, you have people who sell, kids who sell fudge or whatever, and they're out till all 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock yeah. at night, and it's, you're wondering, where, where are their parents? Where, why are they out here? Yeah. And you don't know what to do. You, tell, you ask them, you don't have, you don't have yeah. a home, you don't have, a, you don't have parents, yes. So or when you see them out of school, them. we also have a responsibility to, to report, report children. Kids. I yes. can't yes. remember my, my landlord had work being done on the house and I, I saw the contractor bring a child I knew was of school age. Mm -hmm. And the, the contractor got upset because I questioned every it's single a, day. Why, why is the is child, child not, not in school? school? The child is required to be in school until he, well, I did make the report, but I think I could have easily ignored it knowing it was wrong, but you yes. make a decision Sunshine. to be able to do it. And that's what has to happen. And children until the age of 14 Must be are legally required to be in school. So if you see yes. a 12 year old out, mm -hmm. 13 say even say something yes we, yeah. we have to do a much better job as a community that's probably where we have failed children the most yeah 
We don't say anything about issues like that. Mm -hmm. And if a parent is willing to neglect the child in that way, they're probably neglecting other things about the emotional needs right. and care of the child. Right. So this is why you have to say something, because unless somebody goes in to investigate that situation, mm -hmm. they probably won't find those other things that may be happening mm -hmm. concerning that child. So we must report these instances. And one of the things that we have to, to do is to hold parents responsible. I find, especially with children who may be out of school when we, we deal with those situations, Situations, we tend to focus on the child's behavior and say the child is misbehaving instead of the parents yeah. responsibility right. to ensure that they are providing a safe place for children we need to do much more as a community to, to demand parental responsibility demand it of your neighbors say yeah. to them your child needs to be in school tell them and parents have a responsibility that we can't we can't sit give and to the say state. as much as it is hard and you're right there, there are many societal issues that people are struggling with. Mm -hmm. Some parents are carrying uh, around scars of sexual abuse from their own they are. Mm -hmm. yes. Um I, I have a question about what we call overly sexual children. You know, children mm -hmm. who at a very young age speak of sex, speak of things that just seem inappropriate for their age. That's yeah. definitely I've, a red flag. I've, I've had my nephews speak of children like that at school and mm -hmm. the teachers don't seem to pick up the cues yes. and i don't know if the children are being abused or exposed Posed. inappropriately which are both forms of abuse, which are both forms also, of abuse. so if yes. mom brings a boyfriend home every day yes mm -hmm. it's actually a crime in the yeah. criminal the amendment to the criminal code so people having sex in front of children is a crime um mm -hmm. so it's it's a form of abuse as well so and we need to do again to be more vigilant about things like that. When you see a child that is very sexually alert and aware, aware. Um, inappropriate for their age, it's either of two, one of two things. One, somebody is introducing them to sexual activity, either inappropriately touching them or having sexual contact with them in other ways, or they're being exposed to sexual activity. They are watching things that are inappropriate or they're seeing sexual activity being displayed in their home. I have had instances where I have had people who have come in, and this is very common in domestic violence situations. Mm -hmm. And women who are, I have dealt with situations of women who have experienced domestic violence, and they will tell you one of the, the instances or the situations that they go through is the partner who is the abuser will sometimes demand sexual activity even in front of children hmm. as a way of keeping them shamed and humbling them. That, that I have seen sit more wow. than one situations. And so th this is something that as a culture, we need to address. We don't talk about the issues that are happening in people's homes yeah. that are exposing children at very young age to very sexualized activity. Mm -hmm. I have had women in domestic violence situations that have left marriages because their husbands want to bring in somebody else in the home to have threesomes. They have, I, there are some of these situations that are going on that are exposing children to yeah. sexual activity at very young ages mm -hmm. and are actually part of predatory behavior. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody who is doing that is probably not going to stop at the line of mm -hmm. just the, the adult. Sooner or later, they may demand sexual activity with children. And I've had to say to some women that you have to think about your child. You have, I've had women who have said to me, but you know, they want to leave, but if they leave, they're going to lose their property and they're going to, to yeah. lose everything because then nothing is in their name and I've had to tell them up front. This person is already displaying behavior that we consider and all professionals, social work professionals will tell you is predatory behavior. Mm -hmm. Don't keep defending their actions to say they're only doing it to you. Yeah. And you can manage it because sooner or later he's going to be tired of you. He's going to feel that you are no longer satisfying his need and somebody else in the home that is available for his power and control dynamics, he's going to pray, pray on them. Yeah. And more than one instances. I have dealt with, just since the start of this year, at least five domestic violence instances. We have had to say to the parent, what your husband is doing, this is not just domestic violence. And a lot of it was sexual things that they, they, they were forcing them to do. This is predatory behavior forcing you to watch pornography and putting your, watching it in the open where your children are there for violent pornography, this is not okay. Mm -hmm. You need to be concerned about why he's doing that and why he wants to normalize this in your home. Yeah, yeah. For sure. So Diana, what would be your closing point to the wider public? You know, I think 
there are lessons that can be learned. We don't want to hear of these tragic stories that take place with, mm -hmm. with children, but we can learn something from yes. it. Yeah. What should we perhaps take away from the wider conversation about the child protection system? With all its flaws, nothing is perfect. Yeah. What, what should we remember as a wider community in terms of protecting our children? One, firstly, that protecting children starts with the community. It's yeah. a community responsibility. If you see something, you must say something. Yeah. Two, that even though you may have doubts about the protection agencies that are there and their role, you must make a report because yeah. it is not possible for any kind of legal intervention to happen unless a report is made. Yeah. There is no way the child is going to be protected and the situation investigated if you don't make a report. Mm -hmm. So you must make a report. If you make a report and nothing happens, you make another report. You need to accept it as your responsibility, as part of the community and part of your responsibility to make your community safe, mm -hmm. that you have zero tolerance for any situation where you suspect that a child is a victim of abuse or is likely to be a victim of abuse. And the only way that you display that is by you reporting into the system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And where, where are the main avenues that you recommend reporting? So the Department of Human Services mm -hmm. is the primary responding agency. The police have a support role as also they receive mandatory reports. I usually say if you report to Human Services and you don't see anything, report again, report to the police. Because the more reports you make, you are actually indicating the seriousness of the situation yeah. and you are more likely to mm -hmm. see some action. So sometimes you have to do that. You have to be relentless. You yeah. have to be relentless. You're talking about children who are not going to activate the system on their right, own. Yeah. They need somebody to activate the system on their behalf. So accept that as your responsibility as a part of your community. If you are a village council chairman or a council member or part of the, the team of the, the local government, understand too that you need to consider policies in place for your community that are going to protect children. Yeah. Are you managing the number of bars that are in your community? Mm -hmm. Are you checking on bars to ensure that they're not selling alcohol to children or creating an environment where they're inviting children to be around grown people who are drinking yeah. and who may be inappropriate um, mm -hmm. with children? You have to take on that responsibility. This is the community's responsibility, not just the government's responsibility. Definitely. Thank you very much. We appreciate you coming in to talk about... Uh, the things that we don't like about our community, but we don't like talking about either. So hopefully we've inspired uh, more persons to be more active about making reports to ensure the protection of children, right? We're gonna go ahead now and take a break. And when we come back, we'll be talking to some young football players just back from a competition and we'll hear about the success that they had. Stay tuned.